Good morning. All right, so who won the foosball last night? Anybody? Atta boy. <laughs> so what, what'd you win? No. A micro profile t-shirt. <laughs> Fame, glory, Eclipse Con lower forever. <laughs> Um, so, uh, welcome to the, the Thursday morning, um, which is the last morning of our, of our family gathering. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, getting up in the morning and coming to the keynote. Um, just one and only one uh, administrative announcement this morning. Um, please give feedback. Uh, so the evaluate each of the sessions and again, once again just a reminder that after the conference We will be sending you an email with a survey and we do very much appreciate hearing from you about how you enjoyed the event or what you didn't enjoy about the event um, Yeah, I heard something about Wi-Fi <laughs> it's, it's like Groundhog Day Food's great Wi-Fi And with that I'd like to uh, to introduce Harish, um, our keynote speaker this morning. Um, I was actually uh, the person um, who suggested that we uh, invite Harish to, to give this talk. Um, I saw him speak at a uh, Daimler conference back in July uh, here in Germany, and I, I thought it was a, a wonderful and warm uh, voyage in open source, and I thought it would be uh, something that this audience would really be interested uh, in. And so with no further ado, um, welcome Harish. Thank you. Well, that was a, that's a boom. All right, let me just move a video across. Thank you. 
So with that, I hope you are awake. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed that video. That video is about 14 years old. It was made over a couple of weekends by a colleague of mine in Red Hat because he felt this made a lot of sense to him. So he made this and he made it available to everybody. It's on, if you want to watch it again, it's on a YouTube Red Hat videos channel. So we have hundreds of videos there. So have a look at it and, and remesh, mix it up, do whatever you want with it. So good morning. Ludwigsburg, this is my first time here. I'm very thrilled to be here, and thank you, Eclipse uh, Foundation, for inviting me. Uh, it's a delight. It's always a challenge to be the morning speaker on the last day, <laughs> especially when you had all those fun activities overnight. But thank you very much for showing up and showing up on time. What I've tried to do uh, is, although they hit the, the, the title of this talk says, Insights on Open Source from a 25-year-old company, uh, Red Hat as an organization is indeed 25 years old this year. But I would like to say this is really a different title. It's what happens when you default to open. What is it that happens when an organization, from an organizational point of view, when you do stuff in the open, as open as can be reasonably possible? Now, this is a six-act six talk, all right? So act one, or rather in this case, because it's a software conference, there's a bug here, so it's act zero, right? So we offset from zero. Let's talk about fish. How many of you like fish? Oh, oh that's fantastic. You know, I'm done. <laughs> so, so let's look at fish. I'm going to tell you a story about a couple of gentlemen from the 1800s, the mid-1800s. And one of them was a student who wanted to learn everything about entomology. Entomology is a study of insects. So this, he was in Harvard University in Boston, and he had to go meet up with a professor. And the professor was uh, a zoologist, and um, he met up with him and said, hey, prof, I want to learn everything about you know, insects and stuff like that. But this prof is not a guy who deals with insects. He deals with you know, non-insect stuff. So he said, yeah, sure, you can come in, come for my class. So he asks, when can I start? You can start now. So what does he do? He brings him to a room, and in that room, there are a bunch of jars of all kinds of specimens, almost all of them fish. And this was one of the fish that this professor took out. This is the hemulon fish. It's not very large. The picture looks very large, but it's the size of your palm. It's, 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 it's a very small fish. So the prof, let me introduce the two characters in this story. Samuel Scudder is the student, and Professor Agassiz is the person who he uh, reached out to learn all about animals and, and fish and insects and stuff. So the prof tells uh, Samuel, that I want you to take this fish and draw pictures about it, describe it to me. Without any magnifying glass, no microscopes, just use your eyes, your fingers, your nose, and that's it. So he leaves him there and he walks away. Sometime later, about 10, 15 minutes later, he comes back to the, the room and and looks at uh, what Samuel is doing and says, you know, the fish is on the tray. You need to make sure you keep it moisture. You must pour the whatever liquids that are inside the bottle on it so that it doesn't dry up because it's been preserved. So he said, you know, no man is fit to be a naturalist who does not know how to take care of specimens. Why? Because we need to make sure we know what we're doing. We need to be able to make sure that whatever we are looking at, whatever we are caring for, whatever we are investigating, has the necessary supporting structures around it to make sure it doesn't disintegrate on its own or goes on the wrong path. So what he did was, he had to, uh, Samuel had to look at this fish. Remember, this is the 1850s. Isn't the kind of labs that we have today. The smell of all this formaldehyde and alcohol with preserved fish in it, it can be quite overpowering. It's worse than going to a fish market. But this was the place that he was in. And so when he looked at the fish, 
he couldn't tell much, much of interest that he thought would be useful for anybody. So what did he do? He kind of like, you know, took out a pencil, took out a paper, and started drawing the fish. And about an hour later, the professor comes back, and he looks at it and says, what have you done? Well, this is the fish. It's got fins, it's got tails, it's got scales, it's got eyes, it's got this. He said, no, there's a lot more to it than that. And he goes away. And he is now sitting in the lab, looking at the fish with all the smells and everything around him. He just completely gets overwhelmed. And then he begins to see more details in the fish. He opens the mouth of the fish, puts his finger inside to see how, much, how many teeth there are, tries to count them and starts drawing it. And over a period of few hours, he eventually gets into so much detail about the fish, which at first instance he never knew. He never drew any of those things. So from uh, Samuel Scudder's perspective, later on when he finished this project with this professor and went on to become an entomologist, he, he always recounts that first meeting with this prof that because he was forced to sit down and really look at things, to analyze what it is, don't go in on first impressions and say, oh, this is what it is. Dig through, spend time, carve it out, explore it. Keep looking at the fish. It's a very important task. So that's end of Act Zero. Act One. Again, let's look at a fish. I thought we just done with fish. No, actually, we are looking at code. We're not looking at fish this time around. But why code? And why open? Because that was what my uh, title of the talk was. And in fact, my T-shirt here it says, "The power of open." Um, it's all planned, by the way. But really, why? Why code and why open? Now, this I, I don't. How many of you are IEEE members here? The Institute of Electronic. Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Any IEEE members? Yeah, some of you are. Um, they have a, a monthly publication called IEEE Spectrum, which is their flagship publication. And this was an article in the 2005, uh, September 2005 IEEE Spectrum. The headline reads of the article, Why Software Fails. In today's parlance, we probably say this is clickbait. Right, because really this is clickbait. People will say, oh, why? Why does it fail? Why does it fail? Let's click on it, right? But it's interesting. When I read this article, back in the day when I read it, I didn't quite agree with the title. I would have said that the title should have read, Why Software Projects Fail. It's not why software fails. And I'll tell you why, because only after I read to the article, then I realized there was a problem. This article suggests that there are 12 common factors as to why software projects fail. That's what they suggest. It's an IEEE publication. I think we would have to assume a certain degree of uh, uh, you know, academic rigor and so on. So there are, I'm going to list out 12 factors here that was stated in the, in the article. I would like you to say, to, to, if you say this has got to do with software or not, nothing to do with software, either yes software or no software. So this is where I need you to do some work. Now, the first reason cited is unrealistic or unanticipated project goals. Has it got to do with software or nothing to do with software? Nothing. Good. You're awake. Number two, inaccurate estimates of needed resources. Nothing to do with software. Badly designed system requirements. Nothing. Poor reporting of project status. Nothing. Unmanaged risks. Nothing. Poor communication among customers, developers, and users. No. Nope. Use of immature technology. Mm, maybe. Inability to handle the project's complexity. Mm, maybe, maybe not. Sloppy development practices. Mm, maybe. Mm, possible. Poor project management. No. Stakeholder politics. Definitely not. Commercial pressures, totally irrelevant. But these were the 12. And the, the headline of the article was software fails. Why software fails? But really, was it about the code? Or was it about communication? Because if these are the 12 reasons cited, and I think we kind of agreed on this uh, number seven and number nine, 
The rest of them are really about communication. If I don't communicate in the project teams with the people I have to work with, I have to handle politics, I have to handle uh, commercial pressures, and a whole bunch of it's got nothing to do with software. It could be any project on the planet. It's all about communication. So in this case, communication, you translate that into collaboration. How do I work with the right people and how do I make sure that information they need to make a decision with me or with the rest of the team is transparently available? How do I make that happen? So the, the title should actually have been, as far as I'm concerned, Why Projects Fail. I, actually, I did send this request in 2005 to IEEE Spectrum. They didn't publish the article, uh, didn't publish my letter to the, to the editor, but uh, I think I should follow up with it. So if anybody want to follow up as well, please follow up and say you don't agree with the headline. Let's have a review of this uh, many years later. So that's end of Act 1. Act 2. My code repo is mine and yours is yours. Have you heard this before? All the time. We have a problem. As they say, Houston, we have a problem, right? We actually have a problem. Why don't we share the code repository, especially when you are within an organization? I have had conversations with organizations like banks, insurance companies, telcos, that have different projects teams with their own code repository. They do not share, they don't have access to each other's code repository. You're working for the same organization. Why do you not do, uh, allow for something like that? Something is missing. Why is it that? That is the norm in organizations. So the open source way is what Red Hat has always been doing. We, have, we were born in the open source world many, many years ago. And what is it that we do? And this is where I know most of you are also already doing this. There are three parts to what we call the open source way. To create, to share, and to collaborate. Three steps, easy steps. It sounds easy. For some people, it's very difficult. For some organizations, it's impossible. Then what do we do? That's actually a fourth step. The fourth step is rinse and repeat. So go through the same thing over and over again until this becomes the norm. You don't have to think about it. This is how I do. I create this. I put it out there. If somebody's interested in it, they can take that, and they do whatever they want. Hopefully, they put it back in, the improvements, and so on, and we all benefit from it. That's how human civilization got to where we are today. It is also because of that ability to collaborate. We have this notion of permissionless innovation. So I don't have to ask permission from my boss or from my colleagues. Can I build this? Can I make this happen? There's software in this case. We're talking about software. Do it. If you know what to do, go ahead and do it. Why do you need to ask for permission? Who's stopping you from doing it? It's code after all. So ask for forgiveness, not for permission. So if something happened, oops, I'm sorry. Let's back this out and try again. It's so much easier to do it this way. Then wait for permission. And let's say you have to wait. And let's say you got the permission. You work on it and it fails. So who's to be blamed in that sense? The person who gave you permission or you who did it? So it's a very different way, a different argument that we're going to have. Now, this is where I'm particularly proud of the fact that this is, uh, for me, this is my 15th year in Red Hat in Singapore. I, I'm, I'm from uh, Singapore. And this document, or this page on our website, if you, if you want to have a look at it, it is a corporate documents, uh, corporate governance documents. The very first PDF that you see here is the only PDF I'm more interested in on an annual basis. Because every year we have to do uh, internal um, training in terms of making sure you don't do corruption, you don't do uh, you know, bribery, you know, what are the things you need to look out for, the corporate training requirements. And there is one segment of those requirements is about uh, business ethics and conduct. And in that, if you look at this PDF, I would, I would highly encourage you to have a look at it because this is something I'm really proud of. And this is the only reason that keeps me happy to be in Red Hat. If this particular page, in fact, that one paragraph disappears, I'll have, a, I'll have a problem. And I'll show you what it is. So if you go to that document, it's on page two, second last paragraph, 
And I'll read this out to you because this to me is very fundamental. It says, participation in an open source project, whether maintained by the company or by another commercial or non-commercial entity or organization, does not constitute a conflict of interest. Even where such participant makes the determination in the interest of the project that is adverse to the company's interest. This is the reason my Red Hat colleagues here, if they didn't remember reading this, I would want you to read this every year. Make sure this paragraph is there, because that's the reason I'm with the organization. This is a fundamentally important component. And I'll explain a very simple uh, uh, example what this really means. So I'm working on an open source project. I'm from Red Hat. I identified myself, I'm from Red Hat. And I'm working on an Eclipse project. Let's pick one. Anybody want to suggest a, a project? Your favorite project? Okay, micro profile. No, but that has got Red Hat involvement. It's something else. <laughs> Something else has got some other, any other that has got no direct close, Blender. sorry? Blender. Blender, all right. I'm working on that project. And as the members of the project, we have reached a milestone. And there is a requirement in the project that says, you know guys, we need to vote on the future of the project. I got two possible outcomes, outcome A and outcome B. But we have to vote for it. Outcome A is good for the project, for the future. Outcome B is so-so for the project. It will survive, but it's not as good as A would be. Okay, keep that in mind. Outcome A, on the other hand, I'm a Red Hatter. I work for this organization. Outcome A is negative for Red Hat. It's adverse for Red Hat as a business. Outcome B, Nah, neutral, not a problem. So, think about this. Based on this paragraph, if I am to make a decision to vote, I have to vote for A or for B. How many, would you, how many of you would say B? I'm a Red Hatter. Red Hat is going to be negatively impacted by A. B is neutral. How many of you would think I have to vote for B? Looks like nobody. Oh, I see one person, sorry, I didn't see you there. A few there, okay. The answer is actually A. The project has to succeed. If the project doesn't succeed, we have a problem. Red Hat will figure out what to do about the decision. But in doing that from a Red Hat perspective, I am not liable because I have been authorized, I have been empowered, I have been told, look, the project has to be successful. The project is much weaker than the organization. If the project fails because of this, we have a problem. So it is a fundamentally very different way of doing things. And I would highly encourage you, if your organization doesn't already do this, for your employees, your developers, please consider. This is there for you to cut and paste and do whatever you think that makes sense for you. It's in public. That's end of Act 2. Act 3. So how the open source development model has succeeded? Has it succeeded? Do, we, do you think it has succeeded? I think it has. To, to look at that, let's look at a very, 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 very brief history of free software. In other words, how the heck did we get here today, right? So let's go back about 38 years, between 1980 and 1984. Okay, how many of you are younger than 38? Okay, quite a few. So you probably have, this is your life story <laughs> in some ways. For those of us who have been around earlier than that, we, we have some resonance in, in what it is, right? Anybody recognize this gentleman? Of course, the name is there, right? I mean, for everything that he has done and continues to do, I think we need to appreciate and understand that his ideas are the reason why we are here today. 
in a long-winded way because of stuff that he did that changed how software was going to be shared across by people. And why did that happen? This is, an, this is the story that he recounts. If you're interested in reading about additional stuff, there is the book. It's uh, called Free as in Freedom. Now, this is a printer. This is the actual uh, a photo, a, a photograph of the printer that was in use in MIT, where he was a student in the 80s. And the problem with these laser printers, by the way, 1980 time frame. Think about that for a moment. Just think about it. When you go to a photocopy machine, you put your stuff on the, on the scanner, and you press the button, copy, and after a while, it, it does some copying, and then bang. What happens? The paper is jammed, right? Oh, you have to open it up, take out the paper, and then reset everything, put it back in, wait for it to warm up, press OK, and then the next page. Bang, it gets jammed again. And you go through this. It is frustrating. That was how photocopiers were. These printers, these laser, uh, 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 laser printers were actually photocopiers. They were not network-capable printers. So what does that actually mean? It means that although it looks like a network printer, wow, it's fantastic, big guy, you plug it to the network, I send a job to print, bang, it gets jammed. But there is no feedback going to the guy who sent the print job that he doesn't know that his print job is stuck in the queue. And the next person sends, it's waiting in the queue, and so on and so on. And, but the first guy has no idea the paper was jammed, and so he just waits for the printer to be done. So the previous version of this printer, what they had done, and Richard Stallman in his lab, they created was a set of utilities that are able to detect when there was a jam. So they can notify the person who sent the print job. So that, hey, your printer is jammed, please go fix it, because you have to go and clear it. That worked until the printer died. When they got a new printer, a newer version, he tried to do the same thing with this particular printer. Nope, it didn't work. Couldn't detect the fact that there was a jam. And so he asked Xerox whether he can help them fix this problem. What do you think the answer was from Xerox? The answer was no. Even though he offered to fix the code and give the code back to him, uh, back, to, back to Xerox. Now, Xerox, uh, in the book, if you read, uh, Xerox doesn't quite agree with that version of the story, but it sounds reasonable to me, <laughs> okay? It sounds a, a reasonable response from a company in those days. But that was the motivation that subsequently he said, you know, something is fundamentally wrong with software. He created the Free Software Foundation. And in doing so, he recognized that there are things that we need to do as a society in how we make software available. And that's where he came up with these four freedoms. And these four freedoms are really a fundamental uh, uh, aspect to everything that we do, even within the Eclipse Foundation. We may have different nuances to the licenses, but the fundamental principles remain the same. Freedom zero, free to use. Freedom one, free to copy. Freedom two, free to modify. And freedom three, free to distribute. That's it, four simple ideas. And he encapsulated all of them into the general public license or the GNU public license built on copyright. So that was Richard Stallman's contribution. A few years later, this gentleman, Linus, I don't know whether any one of you have read this particular post on, his, uh, on the news group, comp.os.minix. Uh, if you want to have a look at the actual post, if you go to this tiny URL, you can read it up. It's, on, it's all hosted on Google Groups right now. So he basically created the Linux kernel effectively, but using all the GNU tools around it, and that's one of the reasons why Richard Stallman, if he was sitting inside this room right now, he will stand up and say, Harish, can you stop saying Linux and say it's GNU slash Linux? Okay, I'm sure some of you would have heard that, and I, I will agree with him, then he will sit down, then I'll continue saying Linux anyway. So, but <laughs> that's him, and that's how, that's how that works. So that's this particular uh, individual, Linus, you know, he did what he did because he had an itch to scratch. He wanted to get something working for himself. He wanted to make sure that the computers that he had was able to do what he could do instead of being dependent on somebody else. And this was a very important turning point. A few years later from that, this book came out. How many of you remember Netscape? 
Quite a few remember Netscape. Wow, that's a lot of you remembering Netscape. Okay. They had a browser. What was the browser called? Navigator. Does anyone use it now? I, actually, I don't know whether it will work. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if you can get a copy of it and see whether they make it work. Now, Netscape Navigator got open sourced. The code was released because of this book. So this book, essentially what Eric Raymond said was, there is a magic that is happening in this industry in the middle to late 1990s. People are creating components, tools, software at no cost to anybody else, and you can then use it and build your own. The dot-com bubble was beginning to happen. So he kind of wrote it up, and based on this book, based on this one book, a whole company decided, you know what? We are going to open up our browser. Now, interesting story behind that is, even though the code was released, even though people looked at the code, they said, you know what? This code is not worth its while. This is too terrible, too horribly written. Forget it. Let's not bother with it. I don't know anybody had a look at it, but you know, I did have a look at it and say, you know, this is way too much. Uh, a lot of dependency, a lot of if defs, a lot of if and and def, and all kinds of stuff. Way too many comp uh, uh, combinations. But because of that one action on that one organization, today we have a, another organization called Mozilla Foundation. So we have Firefox as the browser. This is how the story goes, right? Now, I want to understand from all of you, how many of you recognize this one here? The word open source, or the phrase open source. It is actually a marketing phrase coined by a lady, Christine Peterson, in 1998, to make free software acceptable to newcomers and businesses. Did you know that? That means before 1998, if you use the words open source together, people are wondering, what are you talking about? Until then, everything was free software. It is still free software, but we have this additional marketing phrase in front of it. At that same time as well, once this began to happen, the open source initiative got set up. OSI essentially is the custodian of a lot, in fact, almost all of the open source licenses to make sure that people can do collaborative development. That's what these licenses allow us. Collaborative, I give you permission to collaborate with me, and in turn, I can do it with you. That's Act 3. Act 4, licensing. Now, I will assume all of you here are developers, and none of you are lawyers, right? Oops, sorry. None of you are lawyers. But this is one of those things we as developers must understand something about licensing. It is very important that we understand that. It may not be sexy, it may be confusing, but it's important that we understand. Because licensing is a crucial component for the community. If you want to build a community of contributors, you need to have a way to tell them ahead of time, it's a contract, ahead of time, these are the terms and conditions. If you agree with it, please work with me. And this is how I will work with you. It also determines, in some cases, the business model. The statement here is that if you compel source code uh, redistribution, how do you build a business? This is a very important statement. The open source development model is not a business model. It is just an development model. It's got nothing to do with how do I make money out of it. Completely separate conversations. Ray had couldn't figure that out for a long time. We only figured it out in about 2001. We were founded in 1993 up until 2001. We got listed in 1999. We were still not a profit-making company. We were selling t-shirts and CDs for, <laughs> to, to make money and some kind of a support at some point. But that was it. We couldn't figure out how to make money out of it because the focus was, oh, this is an open source uh, development, and so that is the business model. But that is not the business model. The business model is something else. Licensing is the key and fundamental thing that makes it easy for you to get people to, to, to participate. You don't want the licensing to be complicated. 
You want it to be straightforward. If it's too complicated, standard reply will be, ah, too much to read, TLDR, I walk away. Too long, didn't read, I'm not going to bother, I do what I want. Now this is a useful spectrum. If you want to take one slide, a picture of a slide, this is probably what you may want to take a picture of. Why? Because this tells you the spectrum of licenses available. On your extreme right is trade secrets. Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Eef, or whatever else there is, right? All the secret formulas, secret recipe is on this extreme right. On the extreme left, public domain. Beethoven Symphony, they are in public domain. Anybody can do whatever you want with it. And this one here, proprietary licenses. I'm sure some of you in a previous life have downloaded things like Adobe Acrobat Reader and clicked on the install. Did you read the, that one screen? You did. No. No, I was, I was going to say, you did clap, right? So, no, I'm not going to give you a clap because you didn't read it. But if you did read it, you will find all kinds of stuff stuck inside that but one super long page with very fine print. In fact, there's a very interesting story that I'll, I'll, I'll recount to you very quickly. Years ago, I needed to buy a, a, a netbook for my mom. So I got this netbook from a, uh, Acer, a small little guy. So my sons and I, we said, you know, we will, because it came with Windows installed. I wanted to remove it. I wanted to put whatever I wanted in it. So we said, you know what, let's just go through the process of setting it up. The guy in the store wanted to do it for me. I said, no, 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 I'll do it. So we came home, we flipped open the laptop, and then we read, we read through almost every line of that particular, uh, 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 the terms and condition. There was one paragraph, and I would encourage you to have a look at, at search for that. It said that I, as the owner of this device, if I agree, I cannot change the desktop image of the laptop. The screen, the, the backdrop. That was in the terms and condition. <laughs> I, so I read it. I asked my sons, you re read that? Is that? Do you understand the same thing as I understood? Both of them, yeah. Then why are you stopping me from putting my own desktop image at the back? You cannot do so. That, wow, that's, this is incredible. But that was what it was. So if you want to do one thing in your life, and after that, you won't get back the half an hour that you spent on, read any of these <laughs> terms and conditions of proprietary licenses, all right? Enough of that. Let's look at these two in the middle, the green portions. That's, where, that's the reason why we are here as, as a group of developers. That's where the movement in open source co contribution in code and as an organization, Red Hat is able to do what we do. We have both the strong copyleft and the permissive uh, or weak copyleft uh, licenses. Eclipse uh, license is put under the uh, weak copyleft, which is fine. But the important thing is, it is this contract that we now have, we can now do very interesting things. Now, we have a huge challenge still. There's a lot of organizations out there who don't even observe the terms and condition of these licenses. It's a problem, and we have to continuously educate them, make sure they understand and what their obligations are. So remember, look at the fish. If you looked at the fish long enough, you will see all kinds of small little nuances. So Act 4, going on to Act 5. This has got to do with what I call the incredibly fine balance between an open source project and an open source product. Okay, I want you to just think about it for a moment because there is a difference between the two. And that difference is really something a lot of people don't fully appreciate. So what is an open source project? Do you really know what an open source project is? I would assume you know. But I'm going to put up some stuff, some characteristics that I think may be useful to keep in mind. You have idealism to solve a problem. Some problem, you just want to solve it, go ahead and get it done. Don't ask permissions, right? Just go for it. No constraints. There is no product roadmap of your project. How many of your projects have got a product roadmap? Zero. 
You, if you have a map, that's probably from Google Map, right? That's about it. There's no other map. You've got nothing else. You just do it. Come on. No pain, no gain. Unless you try, you don't know whether you can make that happen. Experimentation. Ask forgiveness, not permission. Permissionless innovation. Just go ahead and do it. Just make it happen. These are some characteristics of a project. Risk taking. There is no product requirements document. There's no PRD. Well, what are my requirements for this particular project? These are the things I require. No, there's no such thing. Just go do whatever you think makes sense. Fail fast, fail early. Learn, grow, and evolve. This is very straightforward. That's what a project is. And everybody does the same thing. We keep doing it over and over again until you see, wow, how did this even happen? Was there even a product requirements document when the Linux kernel was built? No, Linus just put it out there, do whatever you want, and something happened over the years. And it just happened because people were empowered to do so. So that's a project. But what about a product? Project and a product. Products have to reduce the risk. You have to re reduce the risk for you as someone making the product available to your customer. Because the customer is going to look at you and say, oh, can I safely run this open source project that you have taken as an open source product that I can use in my enterprise? Can I do that? Now, this is a different conversation. It's constrained in that it needs to meet the customer's requirement. What does a customer really want? Is it, a, is it open checkbook, do whatever you want? That's what I call a project. Is it constrained? This is what I need to do. I need to deliver this. I need to do it now. I need to have a business plan. I need to do this. All the stuff that goes in a business. This is what a product does. A product also does user experience. I know the standard complaint with a lot of people is, oh, you know, I don't like to use the open source project something because the UI sucks. It's horrible. Uh, uh, some people complain GIMP has got horrible UI. Eh, I agree, but it doesn't do the job, it does. Now, could someone take GIMP and make it look like some other proprietary software from a UI point of view? Someone could have, but it hasn't happened yet. But does it do the job? It does the job. Now, this is where UI finesse comes in because now there is a very different audience that he says, look, I'm just a user, I don't care how the code is built, I just want to make it work for myself. And I want to be able to do it successfully. I've got no time to waste. I have no time to debug. I just want to get this thing up because I need to go and play golf. Okay? So that becomes someone who's willing to pay. Scalability becomes important. It's a product now. You have a customer. You need to make sure you can evolve the product. This is not a fly-by-night operation. The project people may leave. The project will be there but a product becomes something that the customer requires. And the last bit here, and I put this, call it separately, called branding. One of the challenges I found in many uh, projects, open source projects, is that when the project becomes kind of interesting and successful project, a company gets created. And that company takes the name of the project. And then the company with the project name creates a product. Now, if you call the product name, I, I, if I call the name out, is it a product that I'm talking about, the company I'm talking about, or the project I'm talking about? Now you have a confusion. Which one am I talking about? So if you ever are going to do something with a project that say, this looks fantastic, and you want to turn it into a business opportunity, give it a different name. Please don't confuse the matter because when you confuse it, people just get completely lost in any conversation that happens. Because which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the product, the company, or the project? Which one? Now, all of this don't exist without people, you and I. This is all people-driven innovation. So what about the people? The type of people that work in open source projects, projects, it's very different from those who do open source products. The product people are the ones who say, oh, you know, I got this customer, I need to do these things, I need to make sure these things happen, I got a, a sign-off, I got to do QA, I need to do testing, I need to deliver this by the end of the month. 
The project guy says, well, yeah, sure, go ahead and do that. I will do what I need to do. Very different mindsets, different ways of thinking, different ways to approach the problem. The motivations are very different. Chances are also, it's very difficult to find somebody who can do both in the mind. You must have a kind of a split personality. Oh yeah, today I'm a project guy. I don't care, anything has happened. Tomorrow, no, today I'm a product guy. The customer is after me, I better get this thing done. No, it's very hard to live that kind of a life. I don't think I want to do that. It's very hard, okay, it's very, very hard. But there are people who can do it, and kudos to them. So that's about people. So you've got product, open source projects, open source products, and you've got people to support these two. So this is a way of looking at it from a slightly different point. There are three, it's a three-legged stool. Open source software and free and open source software is supported by three things. Source code, license, and the community. If the license is not clear, there's not going to be a community. Who's going to participate? Your friends and your buddies, your drinking buddies? Maybe, but once they are not drunk, they may not know what they did, right? But that's a, you cannot have that kind of community. You need some kind of a license and work with the software, whatever it is that you do. Work together. So this is a, a, a three-legged stool. Really, this supports the entire ecosystem. And this is a diagram that shows how we in Red Hat, these are some of the lessons that we learned over the years. And I'll just quickly walk you through that. Right in the middle, the blue bubbles, blue circles, these are the millions of open source projects out there. There are plenty of them. And I think what uh, GitHub was saying, they have something like 20 million repositories or something like that. Take that as a number, right? So in the middle, you have all these projects. Some of these projects come together into mega projects. So like, uh, let's pick one, OpenStack is a mega project. Uh, Patternfly, Apache, CentOS, I don't have Eclipse in here. My apologies. <laughs> Eclipse could have been in there as well. Uh, the Linux kernel, right? Now these are mega projects that become interesting from a Red Hat perspective. So this column here and the column on the other side as well, these are open source projects, open source projects that Red Hat has got active interest in. The people who do these projects, majority of them are the community guys, there are some from Red Hat itself. And then on the extreme right hand side are the open source products that come out of the projects. Okay. Very important observation I hope you made in this diagram is if you look at all the lines, they're all double, double headed arrows, left and right. So just pick one. Let's pick Ansible. Ansible is an open source project. Okay. We call it Red Hat Ansible automation. If there are changes, improvement, bug fixes, security, whatever that we do in the product side of the house, it gets fed back into the project because the project has to be successful, has to continue to be successful as a project. And then it goes back to wherever it must have come from. So it is a bi-directional. It is not one-way street. It's never a one-way street. If it ever becomes a one-way street, I think a lot of our, my, my colleagues in Red Hat will say, you know what, we have failed in our mission. This is not what we signed up for. This is a very important consideration and, and, and understanding that we have internally. That's Act 5. I told you I got six acts, right? Starts from zero. So technically, this is the end of it. But there's a postscript. <laughs> now, this is something a little bit more fun. I just wanted to share with you something that happened earlier this year. I was doing some housekeeping at home. And, you know, over the years, we accumulate a lot of stuff. We are all guilty on that. And I saw this manual from 1996, the Red Hat Linux manual from 1996. This is, about, uh, this is Red Hat Linux 4.1, I think, if I'm not wrong. Okay. So I looked at this manual. Wow, this is pretty cool. Wow, this is nice. As you can see, it's kind of yellowed on the side. And I, I put it on the table and took a picture of it. And uh, flipped open the pages, as you can see. Naturally, the pages are yellowish. The so corners are getting uh, changing color. And I flipped through the pages. This was printed in uh, third of uh, version 3.0, February 1996, 22 years ago. 
So flip through the pages, came to this page, page number seven, and there's this paragraph right here, section 2.4. Let me blow it up a little bit. This is what section 2.4 says. It says, the question it asks is, will Linux replace commercial OSs? The first paragraph reads, while this is a pleasant thought that keeps many of us motivated, in reality, the answer is probably not. This is 22 years ago. The company we know affectionately as the evil empire is too wealthy, too clever a marketing organization to let such a thing happen. Now, when I read this, I laughed, okay. <laughs> Right, okay. On the other hand, the huge development effort and wide distribution of Linux OS will ensure that it takes its place as a real, viable, and significant alternative to commercial restricted operating systems, and so on. This is from 22 years ago. And I don't think there's any viable, commercial, closed operating system other than Windows in the cloud the kernels that run Solaris and any of those things are not sitting in the cloud. They are not in any way able to move the industry forward in that manner. The one that is making that happen is the Linux kernel. And every one of us is a beneficiary of this. Let's fast forward a few years. That was about 1996. In the year 2000, I don't know whether you have seen this before, you have, okay. Now, I don't know whether this was really done or it was done in jest, okay? But <laughs> this is an interesting diagram, a picture that says, there's this guy with the fingers of the bear on this guy's shoulder. But what is interesting is, where is this guy looking at? He's looking at an iMac, right? <laughs> so the picture has got a lot of very <laughs> strange, uh, <laughs> strange components to it. But nonetheless, this is what it was. It's a reminder from your friends at Microsoft saying that when you program open source, you are programming communism. And this was actually said by this gentleman who was the, who was the CEO of that organization many years ago. Now, one of the things that we in Red Hat did, not necessarily in response to that particular diagram, was that we recognized there is a problem in the software industry. So what is the problem? The problem is there are organizations going out and getting software patents. Software patent fundamentally is a problem for us. Not us alone, Red Hat, but us as in the open source development or any software developer. It's a problem. It should not have been awarded in the first place. But the US Patent Office continues to do so. So if that is the case, how do we address this? So what Red Hat did was we created a Red Hat patent promise. What it means is that, yes, Red Hat will actively go get software patents, although we don't like it. We will get it. Once we get it, we will then make it available to anybody in the open source community to do whatever you want with it. At no cost, you don't have to ask permission, just go ahead and do it. So that we want to eliminate that problem completely, as much as we reasonably can. But just by ourselves, it's not going to work. We have to work with other people. So this is a patent, uh, uh, Red Hat patent promise that we updated in 2017. This was first done in 2002. A few years later from there, in 2004, this thing comes up. It says, when you use Linux, you will be sued because there are how many? 228 stolen patents being used in the Linux and open source world, according to the CEO. What are the patents? We don't know. We still don't know what they are, but this is a threat that was made in 2004. 11 years later, what do we see? Suddenly, hey, this is good stuff. We love Linux. Microsoft loves Linux. Really, <laughs> I hope this is true. And I would probably say that I'm actually very pleased that this is indeed happening. The world has moved on. The open way of collaboration makes a lot more sense even for an organization like them. And just 15 days ago, just two weeks ago, Microsoft joined the Open Innovation uh, Invention Network, and they transferred 60,000 of their software patents to OIN, which means all of you, all of us can use this with no fear. No one is going to come and sue you. 
No one is going to spend any money trying to go after you. That's a fantastic change on their side, recognizing that the world has moved on. Let's fix this problem and let's move on. Let's solve real, real, real painful issues. Forget about litigation. The only people who make money there are the lawyers, not the programmers, not the developers, not the organizers, it's just the lawyers, right? So this is a fantastic move on their part and I would say acknowledge that and I'm very glad that this happened. And that's the end of the postscript. Final slide. This week in Red Hat, uh, we call it the We Are Red Hat Week. So I tweeted this, this uh, on Monday. Uh, this is an internal thing for Red Hat, but this particular one happens to hang in the pantry in the office in Singapore. And this is a jigsaw puzzle. And it reads, if you can't read it at the back, it says, We Are Red Hat, the passion of a startup, the perspective of an industry leader, and the power of community. We wrap these three around, and this is what we are. And this is, these are the learnings and the lessons that we have gained over the last 25 years. And I'm very happy to share this with you, because I think you can benefit from this in wherever, whichever organization you're with. So with that, I thank you very much.